I think if you're Greg Sankey, you're probably looking at it and saying, you know what? The reward for winning the Big 12 is the same as the reward for winning the SEC. Yeah, that's, that's not something I, I want to get on board with. And who can blame them? Hello and welcome in. Today is February 15th and we hope that you enjoyed Valentine's Day. We hope that love is in the air. Love is in the air with college football with us. I'm Greg McElroy. Welcome to Always College Football. We have a great show in store for you today. The college football playoff is officially staying with ESPN. We'll tell you what that means. There's starting to become some scuttlebutt. There's starting to become a little bit of conversation surrounding what the college football playoff might look like, not just the next two years, but when things ultimately get to 2026, when we wipe the slate clean, starting to be some buzz about possible expansion, about the elimination of automatic qualifiers. Ross Dellinger had a terrific piece. We'll go through line by line what could happen in the sport that we love so much, especially as it relates to the postseason. And then finally, we'll finish the show by talking about the SEC. We have some truths for the SEC. Every single team in the league will go line by line. This is what this team needs to prove. This is what they are. This is who they're going to be. This is the ceiling. We have some truths laid out for all the SEC teams. So we highlight we will highlight those team by team at the end of the show. So let's not waste any time. Let's get into the new look college football playoff. And it's staying at home with the team at ESPN that's had it from its inception. The expanded college football playoff is officially staying with ESPN. ESPN is in agreement with the CFP to extend the network's deal to televise the playoff for another six years. Now, the original contract... For ESPN expired two years from now. So you'd have the 2024 playoff and the 2025 playoff. Those were the seasons. The actual championship game is going to be played in the 2025 and the 2026 season. And the extension is worth somewhere in the vicinity of $1.3 billion a year. Now, uh, a lot was made of this and a lot of people talked about this. I told you about some aspects of it just a couple weeks ago that there's actually value in the college football playoff, which, by the way, is run by all conferences. There is value by signing an exclusive deal with one network, whether that was Fox or ESPN or if Amazon wanted to get into the mix. There was an, a significant value towards selling uh, basically an entire stake, basically giving exclusivity because there's a premium on exclusivity. And we talked about it a couple weeks ago with the ESPN and Fox. Would they be able to collaborate, all these other things? Yeah, it would. they, they would, uh, clearly. But there's a premium for ESPN and or Fox, whoever ended up winning the bid, to get every single one of those games. I think ESPN basically said, hey, yeah, we're just going to take it all right now. And then we want to reserve the right to sub-license games to other networks. So, hey, Fox, you want to pay us? Fine, pay us a specific amount for a game. Boom, we'll give one to you. Hey, CBS, NBC, you guys want a game? Perfect, write us a check and we'll give one to you. I can't imagine that ESPN is going to be selling any of the quarterfinals, the semifinals, the championships. So I'd imagine that if ESPN does sub-license some of those games, it'll be in the first round games. Those games will be played at a home field, which are, I think, intriguing, at least in year one. But I think the intrigue and the novelty of that could go away down the road. So I think it makes sense for ESPN to do it this way. I think it was a big investment in the sport. But I also think knowing that other networks still have a chance to air some of the games there in the postseason is very valuable to them as well. For a reminder, I know that we, we haven't talked about this in a while, but I wanted to refresh my own memory, so I figured it'd be valuable to refresh yours. First round games. These are going to be on campus, like I referenced. The first game will be played Friday, December 20th of 2024. That will be on a night. That will be a night game there. One game that day, and then Saturday the 21st, will be a triple header. You'll have a noon, you'll have a 3.30, then you'll likely have a prime time. So probably actually more like noon, uh, four o'clock, and then eight o'clock 
more than likely there in a three-window setting. The quarterfinals will be about 10 days later. Similar to what we see right now in the New Year's Six, if you will, Tuesday, December 31st, this will be a night game. It'll be the Verbo Fiesta Bowl. And then Wednesday, January 1st, which I love, it'll be a triple header. You'll have the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl will kick off at noon. The Rose Bowl, which kicks off in its traditional slot there at around 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock in that vicinity. Then the All-State Sugar Bowl, that'll be kicking off at probably 8.45 Eastern time. So those will be the windows more than likely there on January 1st. This will be in 2025. The semifinals will be Thursday, January 9th. That'll be the Capital One Orange Bowl. That'll be a night game. And then Friday, January 10th, that'll be the Goodyear Cotton Bowl. That'll be a night game as well. And the national championship will be played in Atlanta there on January 20th. So that was a little bit of a refresher course, as much for me as it was for anybody else. But those first round games are the ones that I'm focused mostly on given the fact that they're not that far from now. <laughs> We're only about 10 months or so from those things getting kicked off. Speaking of college football playoff, future expansion, some some conversations that are already starting to happen, partly because of some meetings that have taken place, according to Yahoo's Ross Dellinger, over the last few weeks. Now, there were several, several high-ranking college football leaders that started to explore the possible changes to the landscape for not just college football playoff, but for the men's basketball tournament. The SEC, the Big Ten, the ACC, the Big 12, and the Big 12, uh, the Pac-12 were all there, and they opened up with some dialogue with Charlie Baker, the new NCAA president, to examine the possibility of a tournament expansion. Then uh, there was a second meeting. This involved the College Football Playoff Management Committee. This was in Dallas on February 5th, and it was really the Big Ten and the SEC that decided to kind of open up some dialogue with the other eight FBS commissioners and Notre Dame. Remember, Notre Dame's in that in that mix as well on their intent to kind of see what the college football revenue distribution model might look like and what they'll do from a voting structure standpoint in the event in which the Big 12 or the Pac-12 is dissolved, right? So... There have been some things going on behind the scenes, and I thought Ross Dillinger did a great job of kind of reporting what was going on, but they feel, at least the Big Ten and the SEC feel, like there's been a little bit of an unequal distribution to the Power Five, and more specifically to themselves, when they're accounting for a vast majority of the playoff spots, and in the event in which the playoff expands... You see the SEC, for example, they accounted for 40% of the playoff spots in the 10-year sample size of the college football playoff. That was the four-team playoff era. The SEC accounted for 40% of those playoff spots and yet only brought in 17% of the revenue. So they're already starting to look at, all right, well, there's going to be more money. We talked about it with ESPN's expansion and the deal that they just cut for the next six years. $1.3 billion annually there. And you got really the power two versus the other eight. So how will that whole thing work out? We've already talked about the SEC and the Big Ten situation. You got two conferences, 34 member institutions, 26 states. Well, when you really look at the brands, 12 of the top 15 football brands in the country reside in the SEC or the Big Ten. Now, you can probably pick out the others that are not in the leagues, but 12 of the top 15 football brands, according to pretty much all reports, are under those two umbrellas. Now, here's the thing about expansion, and there's already been some scuttlebutt about it. Some has been behind closed doors. Some has been out there, I guess, suggesting you know certain angles, and it makes sense too. Let's start with the Big Ten. Tony Petiti, the commissioner, has privately discussed, and this was according to Yahoo Sports, has privately discussed with commissioners an expansion model that includes 14 and 16 teams with multiple automatic qualifiers to major conferences. That's not that big of a misdirection from where we're at right now. We're at 12 with multiple automatic qualifiers. Greg Sankey, on the other hand, of course, we just talked about it, in the 10 years in which the four-team playoff has been intact, the SEC has accounted for 40% of the playoff spots. Well, 
understandably, Greg Sankey says, yeah, we don't really want automatic qualifiers. We, we'd like to have it as kind of an at-large type of setting. And they are looking at it, uh, not just there on the CFP management committee, but the CFP board of managers, which is comprised of presidents from every conference. So one president from every conference for the SEC, it's Mississippi State's president, Mark Keenum, that have suggested that they would really only be super interested in at-large selections. Totally makes sense from their perspective. Because I think if you're Greg Sankey, you're probably looking at it and saying, you know what? The reward for winning the Big 12 is the same as the reward for winning the SEC. Yeah, that's that's not something I, I want to get all bored with. And who can blame him? Then you have Mike Oresco, who's getting ready to at- retire this summer. He's the commissioner currently of the AAC, the American Athletic the, uh, Conference. Well, he believes that a move to a 16-team playoff could very well be in the future, and that such a tournament would probably be under a format that is 5 plus 11, meaning 5 automatic qualifiers and 11 at-large teams. 5 automatic bursts being given the league champions. I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm not sure it's necessary to continue because I think if we look at where the college football playoff has gone and just how big the gap is right now between the Power 5 and the G5, I think assuming that the G5 is guaranteed a spot is an assumption that I'm just not willing to make. Not right now, not at this moment, not with the advent of NIL and the transfer portal. As far as the format here moving forward, the format this year is still yet to be determined. Now, two years ago, college football playoff uh, leaders, they adopted the 6 plus 6 format, and that starts this year, which means there are automatic qualifiers to the six highest ranked conference champions and then six at large spots to the next six highest ranked teams here's the problem when they voted on that when they adopted that the pac-12 was still a thing the pac-12 is not a thing anymore with all due respect to what's going on out west you can't consider oregon state and washington state to be a power five conference it just doesn't make sense but here's the problem In order to change the current model, there has to be a unanimous vote from the CFB Board of Managers. And the CFB Board of Managers, which is what I just told you about a second ago, is made up of one president from each FBS league and Notre Dame. So there are 11 people that are sitting on that CFB Board of Managers. And the Pac-12 currently has someone on that board. That someone is Washington State President Kirk Schultz, who is the Pac-12 representative. And remember, to change from a six plus six format to a five plus seven format, which is what everyone thinks it should be, nobody in their right mind thinks that it should be six plus six with what's happened to the Pac-12. Nobody thinks that that's possible. No one thinks it's right. No one thinks that's what should happen. But I don't blame Kirk Schultz for kind of dragging his feet because he's trying to make sure that they can get the revenues there in the Pac-12 and split it two ways for maintaining the status quo. Now, remember, the vote has to be unanimous, which means the president from Washington State, Kirk Schultz, has crazy leverage crazy leverage over a massive decision that could change the format over the next two years. And he's already been questioned about it. People are already asking Kirk Schultz, hey, what's going, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, he shot down the idea that his vote is tied to getting uh, to granting of his proposal, but he also declined how he plans to vote in and of itself. Basically, He's going to hold it up as long as he possibly can. And this thing kicks off in 10 months. So there's not a whole lot that there can be done because it requires unanimity to make a change to the current format, which the current format is six automatic qualifiers and six at-large bids. Now, if you're a team in the SEC, the Big Ten, you're going to hate the six-plus-six format. Because you're going to see a team out of the MAC 
or the Sun Belt that makes it to the college football playoff that really doesn't have the resume to justify being included in the college football playoff. So for instance, this year, just using this as an example, imagine being a Penn State fan and being left out in favor of Liberty. Would that be frustrating? Imagine being an Ole Miss fan or a Missouri fan and being left out in favor of last year's SMU. Wouldn't feel so good, would it? Wouldn't feel good at all. Now, there are some times when a team from the G5 is totally deserving of an opportunity, the UCFs of the world, the Houstons back in the day, the Cincinnati's at times. But let's be real. I didn't think Western Michigan deserved a shot. I didn't see a lot of people pulling on behalf of Tulane to make the playoff two years ago. It's a big difference between getting the New Year's Six and getting to the college football playoff. And right now, with how the format is shaping up, it's looking like there's going to be not one but two G5 representatives in the college football playoff in 2024, assuming Kirk Schultz, the Pac-12 representative there in the CFP Board of Managers, assuming he digs in and doesn't adopt the changing format. But Jim Phillips, the, the ACC, Brent Yormark of the, of the Big 12, Greg Sankey, of course, Tom, Tony Petiti, all those guys, they're totally in favor of a 5 plus 7 model for the next two years. But with that needing to be unanimous, I wouldn't bank on it just yet. We're going to dive into the SEC right now. And we need to do a little football. Like this big picture college football is awesome. Like it's necessary. People love it. People eat it up. And it's timely. We play playoff games in 10 months. So <laughs> I get that. But we play game games in just a few months. I mean, we're not that far away from spring games kicking off. We're not that far away from, from us being back into the mix when the portal opens up again. So we figured we'd dive onto the field a little bit. Does that, does that work for everybody else? Because we want, like, I love the field conversation. Like, the big picture, college football is great. Love it. Need it. Necessary. As much of a mess as it feels like it is sometimes. I feel like we need to have some cooler heads to prevail every once in a while. But the game is why we're here, and the game is what we love. So here's a few things that we're kind of coming away with. We, we had structured them initially as questions for uh, every team in the SEC, we are going to now adjust and say statements, you know, heading into spring, heading into spring. So interpret it as, as much as you want. These are, by the way, all of them are for the most part positive. Um, there's some, if you want to read between the lines, you, you might not feel that way, but for the most part, Hey, everyone's undefeated. We're heading into spring and everyone should feel good about where they're at. Let's start with Alabama. This, by the way, is in alphabetical order for those that are saying that we have favorites and biases. No, it's alphabetical order. Uh, Alabama just so happens to be at the top of the list. We'll start with the Tide. Alabama's offense, because of what transpired in the last week, is going to be operating under a pretty significant microscope. Now, I think it's interesting that you can hire a guy that has long been characterized as an offensive innovator, a mastermind, a guy that did an amazing job at both Fresno and then at Indiana, and then as a head coach, and then transferring all of that information into Ryan Grubb, and Ryan Grubb becoming an elite coordinator in his own right. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, gosh, now Bama's in trouble on offense. Like, I, I'm not going to subscribe to that mindset. Okay, so they promote Nick Sheridan who, by the way, got the job at Indiana when Kalen DeBoer left Indiana to go become the head coach at Fresno State. And I think Nick Sheridan operated an offense that was pretty dang efficient there in 2019 and 2020. Now, tight ends coach has been in Kalen DeBoer's hip pocket many, many years. So I'm cautiously optimistic that this is going to be a fine move. Plus, look at the personnel. Like, look at the personnel. Offensive returnees, Jalen Milrose back. And I still think they'll have a quarterback competition because everybody does. Everybody should this time of year. Hey, new coach, new year, quarterback competition. But I'd be surprised if it's not Jalen Milrow that isn't the guy, right? I mean, even though it's a it's slightly different offense with with slightly different principles, Jalen Milrow has progressed mightily 
as a passer over the last year and would expect him to continue to progress as he continues to get more confident. Running back, I think, is going to be a strength. You lose Roydell Williams, fine. You lose Jace McMillan, fine. Uh, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I think Jay Miller's got a chance to be a star. And I think Justin Hayes has a chance to be a really good player as well. Wide receiver is a question mark, for sure. But I like Kobe Prentice. I like Kendrick Law. Jeremy Bernard transferring over from Washington makes me feel pretty confident. Yes, you lose two along the offensive line. But with all due respect to J.C. Latham on the right side, Caden Brockter on the left side, those guys were at times a liability last year. Bring back some guys at the tight end room. I think you look at the pieces that Kalen DeBoer has and the pieces that Nick Sheridan is going to be able to use and operate, they're going to be just fine on offense. Uh, I'm not losing a lot of sleep. Everyone's, oh my goodness, bells are ringing, alarms are going off because Ryan Grubb is returning to the NFL. Yo, they're going to be fine. Everything is going to be fine in Tuscaloosa. Let's go to team number two. That would be the Arkansas Razorbacks. Now, this one might surprise you. And may, frankly, as I was writing it out a little earlier today, it kind of surprised me. How many of you, just be honest by raising your hand, it's, if, you, if you totally remember this because you're a diehard Hog fan, fine. If you're a diehard college football fan and, and all this stuff, because I remembered it, but I was like, oh my goodness, that's right. That's right. Let's, let's, let's remind ourselves that Arkansas might be sneaky good on offense. A lot of people, well, Rocket Sanders is gone. KJ Jefferson's gone. They lose some other weapons. Sure, all can be true. But they also got Bobby Petrino as their offensive coordinator. And it feels like months ago since Bobby Petrino was hired. <laughs> Granted, at the time, very, very... I guess dramatic, if you will, the way people treated it on social media. It was like, oh my gosh, Bobby Petrino's back in Arkansas. Oh. Like, yes, I get it. Bobby Petrino can call a game. That guy's going to score some points. He's going to put people in position to be successful. That is a guarantee. I feel very confident in him being able to coordinate an offense involving some nice additions. Do I know who the quarterback's going to be just yet? No. But I know Jacoby Criswell was very, very well respected at North Carolina two years ago when he got beat out by Drake May, but he didn't get beat out until the second scrimmage of fall camp. That competition went on a really long time. That staff at North Carolina really likes Jacoby Criswell. When they lost him to Arkansas, they were very disappointed. They also added Taylor Green. From Boise State, who at times has been crazy dynamic as a runner, a little inconsistent as a passer, but that's going to be a very intriguing quarterback battle. Now, offensive line's a bit of a question mark. Receiver's a bit of a question mark. I hate losing Rocket Sanders. How could you possibly like that? But I do like the addition of Jaquindon Jackson. Jaquindon Jackson transfers over from Utah where he was at times their best offensive player, even though he's beat up and banged up half the year last year, like everybody else on Utah's team. But Jaquinta Jackson's about 6'2", 230 pounds. You want to talk about running hard and run downhill? That was one heck of an addition. So if you got in Bobby Petrino's offense, you got a quarterback and you got a running back, I think you're off to a pretty good start. So Arkansas might be sneaky good, on offense next year. Let's go to number three. The Auburn Tigers. Wide receiver will go from liability to strength in 2024. You realize that Auburn last year, they did not have one wide receiver that went over 400 yards receiving in 2023. Not one. Now, Rivaldo Fairweather is back. He went for 392 last year. He was the highest receiver on the team. And I think another year with Peyton Thorne and company should be pretty good. Jay Fair returns. He had 324 yards. He should be a reliable go-to target. Former top wide receiver recruit Caleb Burton is back after missing a little time last year. Never got in the end zone, but had a couple moments. Only played nine games. So I'm cautiously optimistic that he could take a step now, that he's getting his feet wet and a little bit more comfortable, and you add a five-star in Cam Coleman. They're going to have a much better cast at wide receiver with depth and with quality 
here in 24. So I think that position could go from a massive liability to a position that could be viewed, could be viewed at season's end or at season's start as a very legitimate strength. Let's go to team number four. That would be the Florida Gators. Expectations are low for Florida. I don't need to tell you that. Vegas has already set their season win total at five and a half. And if you really want to get in the weeds, everybody and their brothers on the under. Because it's like minus 175 on the under. So not a lot of people have a lot of faith in the Florida Gators. Understandably, partly because of the schedule and partly because of the way they kind of leaked some oil down the stretch on the recruiting trail. Remember, there was a time early in the 2024 recruiting trail where they were number three in the country. And number three, now they rank, they dropped all the way to 16th, but that's not awful. I mean, that's not what you want. It's not number three. That's not like it was awful. But I don't think I've seen Florida in a position right now with as with their expectations as low as they are heading into 2024. Florida's going to weather the storm. I mean, I, I really think they might. Now, not a lot of people saw them beating Tennessee last year. And they did. Uh, if you think of the worst years under whether it's Will Muschamp or, or Dan Mullen uh, or, or Jim McElwain, the worst years that they've had in – in their, you know, in their in their tenure as the head coach of the Gators, there was never a time in which any of the three coaches was hoping to get to a bowl game. I really think, though, the expectations are too low. This is still Florida. They return their quarterback in Graham Mertz. They bring in a five-star quarterback in DJ Lagway. Graham Mertz had a solid year last year, by the way. Very solid year. They have a five-star quarterback in DJ Lagway that might have a role in the offense. I think it's highly likely that they're going to have a role in the offense. They bring in defensive line difference maker, potential defensive lineman, LJ McCray, that was a five-star. Uh, that was big. Is the schedule maybe the hardest schedule in the country? No question about it. But I think Florida is going to pull some upsets, man. Yes, they get Georgia. They get Texas. They get Ole Miss. They get LSU. Those are four teams likely to start the season in the top 10 to 12. You get Tennessee, you get AM, you get Kentucky. All three of those games are losable. In addition, you got games against Miami and Florida State and UCF. They have nine legitimately losable games. But I'd be surprised if they lost all nine of those games. I'd be surprised if they didn't pull off some upsets. I'd be surprised if Florida does not overperform in 24 based on what people are saying about them here in the off season. Team number five, Georgia. Georgia's going to get back to business on defense. They just have to. They have to. Now, I remember going into last year saying, I think they're going to be really good at quarterback. I think Carson Beck's going to be really good. Their wide receivers are off the charts good. They're going to be throwing all over the yard. I thought they'd run the ball a little better. Uh, I'll be. I'll admit. I'll freely admit. I thought they'd be a little better running the football. I thought they'd be a little more balanced offensively. I thought they'd be great in the secondary, and thought they'd be pretty dang good against the run. That's where I got it wrong. Is that the group that has long been as proud as anybody, and not just the SEC, but a group that's long been as proud as anybody in the country against the run since 2018 did not resemble themselves. I pulled some numbers for you. 2022, they gave up 77 yards a game rushing. 2021, they gave up 78.9 yards a game rushing. I don't expect them to be as good as they were in 22 and 21. I don't know how anyone could. I mean, look at the guys that were drafted off the defensive side of the football that were on the 21 team and the guys that were holdovers on the 2022 team. So 77, 78.9. How about in 2020? 72.3 yards per game rushing given up. 74.6 in 2019. 
It's been since 2018 that Georgia was not the number one team in the SEC against the run defensively. You know what they gave up last year? I just gave 77, 78, 72, 74. That was in 22, 21, 20, and 2019, respectively. Last year, they gave up 113.6 yards per game rushing. That was the third best in the SEC, so it's not terrible, but it's not to Georgia's standards. They also had minimal losses along the front. Tramel Walthauer, Zion Logue, they're both gone. But you know who's back? Nazir Stackhouse, Warren Brinson, a healthier and more physically mature Mikel Williams, who might be one of the best defensive end prospects in the country. At linebacker, they had to go young at times. Remember, there were times when they had two freshmen playing off-the-ball linebacker for him because of injury. Well, those guys are now sophomores. So Raylan Wilson, Damon Wilson, those guys will be ready. C.J. Allen, Smal Munden will be back as well. So the front seven returns mostly intact which means I think Georgia is going to look a lot more like they did between 2019 and 2022 than they did in 2023 against the run defensively. Number six, the Kentucky Wildcats. Brock Vandegrift is the answer. Now, that's a bold statement because there are some unknowns. there, And we, we right now, nothing is officially official about their new offensive coordinator. Remember, Liam Cohen just left. He was back for a year. It went fine. It wasn't great, partly because of the ineptitudes at times with Devin Leary's accuracy. If you look at how many guys were open versus how many guys were missed, I'm not sure there were more guys missed in the country than were missed by Devin Leary. And then when the times that he did hit those receivers, how many drops did they have? Way too many. Way too many to count. That was a receiver group that had crazy high expectations, but they were a little up and down at times last year. But we all assume that it's going to be Bush Hamden as the offensive coordinator, just waiting for official word. Uh, he's had some time in the SEC in the past. He's been with Missouri, so he's familiar with the league and understand what it takes to be successful in the league. But the quarterback position the last two seasons has been a bit of a headache for Mark Stoops and his team. Still been great on defense at times. Still been great at other positions as well, running the football from time to time as well. But if you look at what happened with Will Levis throughout the 2022 season, he was battled, battling injuries most of the time. He was banged up, beat up, all those things. Then you look at all of last year under Devin Leary, who had a tough time kind of adjusting to the pro-style scheme that Kentucky wanted to run. Well, now you bring in a guy that does have some pro-style experience in a former five-star in Brock Vandegrift. Was originally committed to play for Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma. Late in the game, flipped to commit to Georgia and backed up Carson Beck in 2023. Ended the portal and now has two years of eligibility remaining, but he does not have a lot of offensive experience in the Power Five. Just 76 offensive snaps that he's played in his college career, but I am really optimistic that he will be the answer for the up and down quarterback play that we've seen from Kentucky two seasons. Number seven, the LSU Tigers. The offense will be great, but the defense needs to take a step. We know this. I'm not telling anybody that watched Jaden Daniels, anybody that watched the entire LSU season last year knows it was so frustrating to watch them drop games to Florida State, Ole Miss, Alabama. LSU's defense struggled mightily, allowed at least 42 points and giving up at least 494 total yards in each of those three games. They finished 105th nationally in total defense, giving up over 416 yards per game. They allowed 28 points per game, which is tied for 78th in the FBS. You know who they were tied with? Akron. And I think of LSU defensively, and I think of Akron defensively, two very different perceptions on that side of the ball. But they went out, and I think they made one of the best hires of the offseason from a coordinator standpoint. Blake Baker, he is now joining LSU staff, one of the highest paid defensive coordinators in the country, and did an amazing job at Missouri the last two years. 
He also has experience on the Bayou. He coached at LSU in 2021 and also has served as the defensive coordinator and at Louisiana Tech. So he's been eight years as a defensive coordinator experience, now heading to LSU. And you look at what Missouri was last year. As a unit, they were number four in the SEC in scoring defense, gave up under 21 points a game. Number five in the league in rushing defense, gave up 122 rushing yards a game. And number five in total defense, had 336 yards a game given up. They led the SEC in ranked number four nationally in fumbles forced. They forced 17. And they were number 11 in the nation in sacks with 39. The Tigers were among the top 20 of the nations in fumbles recovered and tackles for loss as well. So this is an aggressive group. It's an attacking group. And I think Blake Baker, with that personnel, will revitalize that side of the ball and make a more complimentary team for Brian Kelly there in Baton Rouge. And the thing about what Mississippi State wants is their athletics direct, director, Zach Selman, said, I don't want to just provide a, a product that's going to win games. I want to provide a product that is nationally intriguing nationally consumable but that's not really who mississippi state's been in the past mississippi state at their very best while yes they got to number one in the cfp back in 2014 they were a team that's always been a blue collar defensive minded physical you know want to punch you in the face type of team they haven't really been a flashy product they haven't really been a group that's going to just pour it on you offensively so jeff levy stepping in is a pretty big difference from what we've seen in the past from Mississippi State. The good news is he's already signed a top 35 class, which is really exciting. They've already assembled a core of wide receivers with a high-profile quarterback. So whether or not that quarterback is able to jump up and start from day one is unlikely because they brought in Baylor transfer Blake Shapin from the portal. And you think about what's been challenging for Mississippi State in the first year of their head coaches in the past. Only Joe Moorhead won six or more games in his first season. Now, Joe Moorhead's tenure lasted two seasons. Dan Mullen, who is one of, if not the best coaches in the history of Mississippi State football, he went five and seven in his first year back in 2009. So it's going to be tough for Jeff Levy, but putting together a offense I think it's something that's highly likely knowing Jeff Levy's tenure and his familiarity with the SEC. Moving on to a team that would have made the college football playoff last year had the 12-team system been in place, the Missouri Tigers. The big question for them is, you know, what was 2023? Is it a sign of things to come, or is that the new standard? Or was that more the anomaly? Because I think Missouri's number one goal is to prove that 2023 was not a fluke. Because the expectations surrounding Eli Drinkwitz Tigers are, are going to be sky high this year. Now, in fairness, there have been a lot of great teams. A lot of teams with crazy high expectations that fell well short of expectations in the past. Now, we know that a playoff berth is... Absolutely a possibility for Missouri. Assuming growth at a few different positions, assuming you fill some of the voids and the departures of the defensive side, like there are a lot of reasons to like Missouri heading into this season. I like them an awful lot. But we've also seen teams like USC that used a ton, a ton of progress that was made in year one under Lincoln Riley only come back to earth last year to a seven and five record. I think that'd be a tough thing to imagine for Missouri, but this was a team that was 4-0 in one-score games last year. Those things have a unique way of kind of reverting back to the mean in the following year. Now, Brady Cook's back, had a great year, threw for over 3,300 yards, 21 touchdowns against just six interceptions. They have a dominant trio at wide receiver with Luther Burden, Mookie Cooper, Theo Weiss. They're in really good spot there, but I do have questions on defense. Uh, a lack of coaching continuity with the departure of Blake Baker is something that could be problematic. They lose a bunch of impact players to the NFL as well. So while I love Missouri this year, I do think they have a lot of pressure on them. 
And playing with the target as opposed to playing with nothing to lose is something that could also have a pretty big impact on what they're actually capable of this year. But I think they're going to be pretty good. They just have to prove to the world that this is a sign of where they're going to be moving forward as opposed to the one-year blip in which they rally up when a New Year's Six Bowl game against the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's got the team number 10. That's the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, the Sooners, they have to prove that they are ready for the grind. Now, if you look at Oklahoma's schedule, they have one of the toughest schedules in the SEC. All right, they have Alabama, Ole Miss, Missouri, LSU, and Tennessee. All of the aforementioned teams won nine or more games last year. Now, they've recruited SEC-level talent, but they also have a lot of things to prove. Now, Brent Venables in his two years in Norman, 10 and 8 against the Big 12, which is not bad, especially when you take into account just how much better they were this past year than they were the year before. So progress was made. The problem is the Big 12 got a whole heck of a lot easier last year, and yet they still had losses to Kansas, had a loss to Oklahoma State in year number two. And three of their 10 wins came against Big 12 first-year teams in BYU, UCF, and Cincinnati, all of which just now got to the Power Five. So I believe that Oklahoma is absolutely trending upward, but there are some question marks. I mean, I think Jackson Arnold's going to be a really good player. I love the hire of Seth Luttrell. I think they've done a good job of, of reinforcing some depth in the portal to an extent. They've done a good job in the recruiting trail with high school ranks. But this grind that they're about to experience with their schedule is unlike anything they've seen ever in the Big 12. Same can be said for Texas, frankly. But it does feel like with Texas's surge into the playoff last year, they're more capable and more prepared to rally up and play teams like this on a week-to-week basis. We'll get to team number 11, the Ole Miss Rebels. We're going to have a better understanding. The ceiling right now for Ole Miss is 11 wins. Okay, that's the ceiling. Last year, it was the best they've ever been. No team in the state of Mississippi has ever won 11 games in a season. Well, Ole Miss did it last year. And they did so in playing just eleven, uh, just 13 games. But the problem is the gap between where they were last year with 11 great wins, win over LSU, uh, Peach Bowl win over Penn State, A lot of really positive things, but the gap between them and Alabama and them and Georgia still felt pretty significant. They beat a lot of good teams last year, a lot. But it does feel like this year Ole Miss is poised to make even more of a step towards competing against Georgia and Bama. Now, will they ultimately get over the hump and beat those teams in a playoff setting or in a championship setting? I I don't know the answer to that. It feels... Like, that's a pretty big gap that needs to be made up. But look at the additions that they've made on defense. Look at the continuity that they have on offense. There's a lot to believe that makes you think that they can make a legitimate playoff push. Jackson Dart is back. Thought he had a really nice year last year. 23-5, and touchdown-interception ratio. Added an awful lot on the ground, nearly 400 yards rushing. Eight rushing touchdowns. You add another weapon in Juice Wells. Look at the reinforcements that they've added on defense. I think defensively, they have a chance to maybe have the best group collectively that they've had since Lane Kiffin took over in Oxford, Mississippi. And I think they'll be able to score. That I'm not concerned about. Losing Quinchon Judkins, yeah, that's a blow for sure. But I think they'll be fine at running back. I think they'll be fine at wide receiver. I think they'll be decent along the offensive line. I think they'll be good at quarterback. I think for the first time, they have a chance to be a top half defense in the SEC under Lane Kiffin. Maybe even top five defense in the SEC under Lane Kiffin with some of the additions that they've made in the portal. Number 12, South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina's depth is going to get tested. Uh, Aside from the three non-Power 5 games against ODU, Akron, and Wofford, the combined record of South Carolina's eight other 2024 opponents was 75-34. and That's 69% winning percentage. If you take out Vanderbilt, who went 2-10, and 10, that winning percentage amongst South Carolina's opponents jumps to 75%. Now, what's ironic about all that is while the schedule's challenging, they don't have Georgia, 
They don't have Florida, and they don't have Tennessee. Yet, they're still faced with a murderer's row of teams that they're going to have to play. It does feel like Shane Beamer is in need of a signature win. He obviously had one at the end of the 22 season when he knocked off Clemson, but that feels like forever ago for Shane Beamer and his staff. And they have plenty of signature win opportunities that are on the schedule here in 24. You got LSU early in the year. That's on September 14th. You got Ole Miss at your place, October 5th. You go to Alabama on October 12th, to Oklahoma on October 19th. That's a heck of a three-game stretch. Ole Miss at home, at Bama, at Oklahoma. You get Texas A&M that comes to you on November 2nd. Missouri comes to you on November 16th. And then you go to Clemson on November 30th. So... There's a lot of opportunities there for Shane Beamer. Is he going to go undefeated? Absolutely not. No chance. But if they can pull off one, maybe two wins against teams that they're not expected to beat in the preseason based on preseason expectations, that's going to continue to endear Shane Beamer and his staff and his players and the program that he's built to a remarkably supportive fan base. So I think you got to get a couple big wins. But man, their depth will be challenged because they're thinner than most and they have one heck of a gauntlet that they're going to have to play against. For Tennessee, that's the next team up. Nico Iamalieva feels like he's the answer. All right? He feels like he's the answer. Now, Tennessee could have the breakout star in college football this upcoming year. But what we've learned with Tennessee is they're going to go as their quarterback goes. Their quarterback plays at a crazy high level, they're going to be really tough to beat. If their quarterback misses a lot of open targets, misses a lot of layups, their ceiling drops down considerably. Now, when we take into account Nico's lone college start, they destroyed Iowa in the cheese at Citrus Bowl. But... Ia Malieva, I know I gotta get, I gotta get used to saying that better, right? Ia Maleava, Ia Maleava, Ia Maleava, Ia Maleava finished the game with only 151 passing, did throw a touchdown, uh, ran for three more. But if you look at the numbers and when you dive into that performance, the numbers don't go out of control; they don't jump out. But a couple things that did was the athleticism. For a guy that's that long, he can move laterally. Uh, and for a guy that's that, long, that's that long, he's pretty decisive and has some good agility too. And while he didn't throw it a ton in that game, just 19 pass attempts, it looks like he's very comfortable throwing on the move. Now, there were a few times too when you dive in, probably left the pocket a little too early. Probably was a little anxious to get out of the pocket. It's a little bit cleaner when you escape the pocket, but it does shrink the read by half when you exit in one direction which he most notably did to his right then you're only going to have two maybe three wide receivers to that side so maybe hanging in the pocket a little bit more will be a heavy focus this spring but you can tell the ceilings there just in one game of legitimate work against what i think is a high quality defense out there that he was facing in the iowa hawkeyes let's go to team number 14 texas now texas is back there's, there's no denying that, but they will be under way more pressure now that they're in the SEC and now that they broke through in remarkable fashion last year. Now, Quinn Ewers is back. Now, he headlines all the returning players. And if you look at just where he was two years ago to where he was last year, going from 58% completion to 69% completion, he's really close to proving that he is a championship caliber quarterback. No doubt about it. They also bring back a lot of quality along the offensive line. Whether it's Kelvin Banks at the left side, Hayden Connor, Devin Campbell, Cole Hudson, they bring back a lot of depth along the front offensively, which should be very encouraging. The secondary, you got to think they're going to improve from last year to this year. you got a couple of young corner prospects in Terrence Brooks, Malik Muhammad, that should be coming into their own. The big question for me with Texas is linebacker and defensive tackle. It is wide receiver to an extent because I look at the guys that departed, just how good the guys that departed were, and I also look at the portal additions, and I just don't think there's going to be that much drop-off at wide receiver. It might be a little, might be a lot, but even if it's a lot, they still are probably going to have a pretty dang good group. 
based on who they brought in the veteran presence that they brought in that position. What they won't have are two defensive tackles that completely take over the game. And what they also won't have, they might be good at linebacker, but Jalen Ford won't be patrolling sideline to sideline. He was an eraser last year. So in the event in which those two defensive tackles didn't make the play, there was big old number 41 to make that play right behind him. He did a great, great job last year. So replacing the middle of that defense will be something that will be challenging for the defensive coordinator, Pete Kwiatkowski, and for Steve Sarkeesian as he tries to match and exceed what he accomplished in a breakthrough year of 2023. Number 15, Texas A&M has the pieces, but they need to be consistent. That's it. The good news is, under Mike Elko at Duke, they did more with less the last couple years. Texas A&M did less with more the last couple years. That should sum everything up and why Mike Elko is now the head coach of Texas A&M. Now, the recruiting success, I'm not sure anybody was that concerned about Mike Elko's ability to attract top talent to College Station. Uh, you look at what they've already done, done a pretty good job. You look at what they've added in the portal. They acquired 22 players and had a 2024 recruiting class that had multiple signings, including five-star Terry Bussey. Could be looking at nine, possibly 10 wins right out of the gate. It's certainly possible, especially when you take into account what they bring back. You got Shamar Turner, who might be one of the best defensive linemen in the league, defensive linemen in the league. You got Connor Wigman, whose back was on to a tear early in the year last year, but did get banged up and missed time down the stretch. So you got good leadership on both sides of the ball. But the big question that I have for AM might be at wide receiver because losing Anaya Smith and Evan Stewart, Anaya Smith to the NFL draft, Evan Stewart to Oregon. That leaves a pretty big vacancy. Who's going to step up as the number one? Will it be Moose Muhammad? Will it be Jade Walker? Will it be Noah Thomas? They'll all compete for the starting spot next year or next month when they get going in spring football. But you also got to look at a couple guys they added from the portal, like Louisiana Tech wide receiver Cyrus Allen. A uh, lot of experience, ton of versatility, a lot of speed. So I think there's quite a bit to like about Texas A&M this year, and a lot of people are starting to kind of get on board with the Aggies. I think they're very dangerous. Now it's about whether or not they can be consistent because they've been dangerous for a while. We've seen teams that went 500 or worse play and beat again, beat some of the best teams in the sport. But we've also seen them lose to the likes of Appalachian State and other programs that had no business playing Texas A&M for a 60-minute ball game. And then finally, we'll finish up with Vanderbilt. Now, Clark Lee, I think, is, is doing a pretty good job, man, under the circumstances. I mean, he is doing a pretty good job. The problem is the league just got tougher, and there is not a single team on that schedule that you're like, you know what, Vandy's going to 100%, no doubt, guarantee, get that one. Now, I think they'll give some teams all they want. And that's what Vanderbilt, that's what they need to be. Look, the goal is to hopefully get to within striking distance of bowl eligibility. But you look at some of the pieces that they had on the roster the last couple of years. I mean, Vanderbilt has gotten rated by some on the portal. I mean, George has gone in and got some guys. Other people have noticed that, oh, Vandy's got a couple guys here. I'm going to go get that guy. I'm going to go get that guy. So it's been hard for them to retain talent. Now, they've developed pretty well. I think Clark, Lay is a, Clark, Clark Lee has established a culture and a foundation but what's the ceiling? I think all of us are, are wondering what the ceiling really is because as the SEC has gotten deeper, as the SEC has gotten stronger, Vanderbilt feels like they're better, but their improvements have not increased enough to the point in which they can have a legitimate presence there in the middle to bottom half of the SEC. So pulling for Clark Lee, I think he's doing all the right things. Just can you retain talent in today's day and age in college football? That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Please continue to like, rate, and subscribe to the show. 
wherever you get your show. We really appreciate all of you coming to us from wherever it is you're coming to us from. That's on the ESPN podcast platform. Hit that thumbs up button. Or if you just want to go and rate, review the podcast, that'd be terrific as well. Download it from anywhere on whatever platform you're on. So for all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.